Every summer, I have the distinct pleasure of spending an entire month with people from all over the world here in Dallas, teaching the Arabic language, Quranic Arabic, the language of the Quran, and discussing and exploring the timeless lessons and wisdoms of the Book of Allah. We call this experience Quran Intensive. Please check out BayinaSummer.com. That's B-A-Y-Y-I-N-A-H Summer.com to get more information and sign up. I look forward to seeing you here, inshallah, at the Quran Intensive. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Wala nukallifu nafsan illa wusaha wala dayna kitabu ya tiku bil haqqi wa hum la yudlamun Bal kulubu hum fi gamratim min hadha wala hum a'malum min duni dhalika hum laha amilun Hatta idha akhadna mutrafihim bil adhab idha hum yaja'arun لا تجأروا اليوم إنكم منا لا تنصرون قد كانت آياتي تتلى عليكم فكنتم على أعقابكم تنكسون مستكبرين به سامرا تهجرون <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين. So inshallah we're starting from ayah number sixty two. Allah سبحانه وتعالى says ولا نكلف نفسا إلا وسعها ولا دينا كتاب ينطق بالحق وهم لا يظلمون. A very brief translation of the ayah is. We do not burden any soul with more than it can bear. We have a record that tells the truth. They will not be wronged. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 62, to briefly explain, because if you just listen to the translation of the ayah, and you take into consideration what we discussed in the previous session, in the previous passage, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about the, the qualities of the believers. And the qualities of those who succeed, and what it really takes to believe. And so now, ayah number 62, Allah starts off by saying, وَلَا نُكَلِّفُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وُسَعَهَا That we do not burden any soul beyond its capacity, except for what it can accommodate, what, can, what it can take. So how does that relate? What is the connection between the previous passage, which talked about the qualities of these remarkable people? You know, we discussed them in the Ladina Hum in Hashati Rabbihim Mushfiqun, Wal Ladina Hum Bi Ayat Rabbihim Mu'minun, Wal Ladina Hum Bi Rabbihim La Yushirikun, Wal Ladina Yutuna Ma'ata, Wal Kulubu Hum Wajilatun, Anna Hum Ila Rabbihim Rajiun, Ulaika Yusari Una Fil Khairati, Wal Hum Laha Sabiqun. So, having talked about that, how does this connect to that and relate to that? So, in ayah number 62, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining that everything that was mentioned above, everything that was mentioned previously, and it was quite remarkable, and uh, it's possible that listening to it, someone finds it very inspirational, but it's also quite possible that after reading it and reflecting on it, somebody might sit there and think that this is obviously outside my capacity. I don't know if I can do that. Because there were some very remarkable things that were mentioned there. The level of sincerity and the level of consistency that they have in their relationship with Allah. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here in ayah number 62, He starts off by explaining to us, وَلَا نُكَلِّفُ The word نُكَلِّفُ كَلَّفَ يُكَلِّفُ تَكْلِيف In the Arabic language, it means to obligate. And a lot of times you see the translation of burden. But really that's kind of a, um, a more negative word in the English language, but it means more so to obligate. And so Allah says, وَلَا نُكَلِّفُ نَفْسًا We do not obligate any soul, anyone. إِلَّا وُسَعَهَا Except its capacity. And the word wusa in the Arabic language is very interesting. In Surah Al-Baqarah, at the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, لَا يُكَلِّفُ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وُسَعَهَا That Allah does not obligate any soul beyond its capacity except for what it can accommodate, what it can take. 
But later on in the du'as that Allah gives to us at the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, He says, رَبَّنَا وَلَا تُحَمْلَا مَا لَا طَاقَةَ لَنَا بِهِ Oh Allah, do not obligate us, do not put on top of us more than what we can, more than مَا لَا طَاقَةَ That which we do not have the strength for. So what does that exactly mean? So here it's very important to kind of note the meaning of wusa'a. Wusa'a is the capacity of something. Taqa is to just have the strength. Now it's possible something is within your capacity, but it might be a little tiresome, it could be a little difficult. It would require you to strain yourself, but it's still within your capacity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, لَا نُكَلِّفُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وُسَعَهَا We do not obligate any soul beyond its capacity. وَلَدَيْنَا كِتَابٌ So before we actually go forward to kind of talk about this concept of uh, Allah does not obligate any soul beyond its capacity, this is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about other places in the Qur'an, as I mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah, لَا يُكَلِّفُ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وُسَعَهَا Allah has not burdened or obligated any soul beyond its capacity and what it can handle. And so this, leaves, this brings about a question. All right, this, this now, now over here we have a question. The question basically is, is that typically when we say this, or we read this ayah, we reflect on it, that Allah does not obligate anyone, any soul beyond its capacity. Then we talk about some of the obligations of Islam. And so the obvious conclusion is that everything and anything that Allah has obligated us to do, that Allah has made obligatory, mandatory upon us, is actually within our capacity. And for us to complain about its impracticality, or the fact that I can't do it, is actually problematic. And it's a deeper personal issue and problem. It's a spiritual problem. That if Allah has obligated it, then obviously it's within my capacity. But now this leads to a very valid question, so that's the first kind of conclusion you arrive at. So if Allah said pray five times a day, that's obviously within my capacity. If Allah said fast in the month of Ramadan, that is within my capacity. If Allah said give zakat, and so on and so forth, whatever the obligations of the deen, the religion may be, they are within my capacity. And for me to feel that I can't do it, is actually something more problematic on my end. There's nothing wrong or dysfunctional with the religion, it is something wrong or some type of dysfunction within myself spiritually. And how I'm handling it. And beyond even spirituality, we also come to realize, even in terms of worldly affairs and worldly issues, right? Um, whether it's your school or it's your job or your occupation, whatever it may be, or personal relationships and family, that a lot of times things that are deemed obligatory, mandatory, I'm talking even outside of the Islamic scope. I'm not speaking from the Islamic mindset, just culturally or generally speaking, what is expected of a lot of people. And we find it to be, I can't do it, it's out of, outside of my capacity and I'm not capable of it. And we end up realizing, it usually takes a little bit of maturity and a little bit of advice, a mixture of the two. And we end up, and a lot of self-reflection actually, and we end up realizing that, well, maybe the real problem is, is that I have a, a more deeper issue in terms of how I am prioritizing things and how I'm allocating my resources. How am I allocating my time, right? And how am I utilizing my time, my money, my resources, my strength, my energy, my talents, my abilities? And that's where a lot of the optimization of an individual comes into play. And you learn to how to better yourself and optimize yourself, right? And so spiritually now carry the same idea forward, that first and foremost, it could be a spiritual problem. And secondly, also just take a very practical look at it. That maybe I'm not prioritizing my, maybe I'm not prioritizing these obligations, and maybe I'm in serious need of some optimization in terms of how I utilize my time, my resources. So that's a second thought here. But there's still, after all that discussion, and maybe that solves the problem for 90% of the people, okay, that okay, this is just a problem that I personally have, there's still a very valid question that remains for some folks. And that is, what if that obligation really, truly, due to a real circumstance or situation, is actually, right now, at the moment, in this predicament, outside of my capacity? I'm really not capable of it. Now, that becomes a very serious question. Right? So, praying five times a day. Now, I find myself in a situation of travel. 
And due to travel and its demands and the situation and the circumstances that sometimes travel comes along with, praying the five times prayers at their specific times with all the different raka'at and you know the full, ob- the, the full scope of the obligation, it's just not practical. Or what if it's a month of Ramadan, okay, and all the excuses of, well, they're 16 hours long and it's 100 degrees here in Texas, and you know, with some readjustments and some prioritization, I'm able to figure out that I'm able to fast. But what if it is the month of Ramadan? All right, and I'm doing everything that I personally can, but I have some real serious physical illness that does not allow me to actually fast. And you can see where I'm going with this. What we then have to understand, and that is what Surah Al-Hajj, Surah number 22 talks about at the end of Surah Al-Hajj, where Allah says, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِهِ هُوَجْتَبَاكُمْ وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجٍ that Allah says that strive for the sake of Allah to the best of your ability as Allah deserves from you. He chose you. And then Allah says, and He has not made within the religion, He has not put on you, even within the religion, even a, the slightest bit of impracticality. Min haraj. So then what we have to understand, and do, this is usually due to a lack of knowledge. So again, I'm going to, kind of reset so that my thoughts are coherent and you understand what I'm saying. Allah is saying we do not obligate anybody beyond their capacity. That means that everything Allah is obligated, I'm capable of. I just have to figure it out. I just have to be a little bit more responsible and serious and mature. But even after that point, if I really do have a real circumstance, a real situation that is not allowing me to do what is obligatory or mandatory in this situation, then again, instead of finding fault with the religion, what I really need to do is actually learn the religion. Because what's really remarkable in that situation, is that you will find that the Qur'an and the Sunnah, the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, have clearly laid out that there are concessions. And there are exemptions. There clearly are. So if you find yourself in a spiritual quandary, right? Because you're like, look at my situation. I'm not able to pray physically, you know, standing up and doing ruku and sujood. Or I'm not able to fast in Ramadan. Or I'm not able to go for hajj due to financial reasons then what I have to actually understand is that my religion has already addressed that. And there's no reason for me to be in a spiritual crisis. That's just a lack of knowledge. And even family-wise and communally, we sometimes also create the dynamic where we put unnecessary, undue guilt on people and create, forget about the physical or financial hardship, the greatest hardship you can put on anyone is spiritual hardship. We put spiritual hardship on people because we're making them feel guilty for doing something that Allah exempted them from. That Allah exempted them from. Right? So that's what we have to understand. And again, the the scenarios are very clearly laid out. I can't go through all the different ahkam. That would take a very, very long time. But we know, while traveling, Allah has provided the facility of qasr, shortening the prayer. And difference of opinion, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to some of the scholars, that Allah has provided the facility of jama'ah, combining of the prayers. That due to travel or illness, as the Qur'an talks about, in kuntum marda aw ala safarin, right? That Allah has uh, exempted a person from fasting, or rather given the concession that a person doesn't have to fast at that moment, but can make it up later at another time, where they're not ill or they're not traveling. And if somebody reaches a particular point or somebody is you know, dealing with a situation physically where they're just not physically capable of fasting and it's not likely that they will be um, physically capable of fasting, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has completely exempted them from that. And they're able to pay the fidya, pay a very nominal amount in exchange for every single fast. And if they have financial circumstances on top of that where they can't even afford to pay that nominal amount, then that's not even mandatory obligatory on them. 
A man comes to the prophet, and see, and we're talking about really legitimate situations where people have a real uh, situation. A man comes to the Prophet Wasallam, and he has violated one of the fasts in the month of Ramadan. He has violated one of the fasts in the month of Ramadan. Right? So he engaged in intercourse while fasting. And he comes to the Prophet ﷺ with this situation. This is what I did. Now, as we know, taught by the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, that when somebody ends up violating a fast of the month of Ramadan in that manner, that not only do they have, did they break their fast, and they have to make it up, but they are, a penalty is also due upon them. And the Qur'an talks about that penalty, that it's one of three things. In this order. Number one, they have to free a slave. If that's not possible... Right? And as in our situation. Then number two, they have to fast for 60 days straight. And if that's not, they're not capable of that, then they have to feed 60 people a day's meal. Masakim. People who are in need. So this man comes and presents himself to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ lays out these options. These are your penalties. Kafara, expiation. And as he goes through one after another, the man says, I... I can't afford to free a slave. I'm a poor, simple man. And number two, fasting for 60 days, he says, I'm not strong enough to do so. Feeding 60 people, I'm a poor man. So the Prophet ﷺ then takes some money that was given to the Prophet ﷺ, and he gives it to him and he goes, here, go and give this as sadaqah, as charity, as a penalty for violating the fast of Ramadan. So the man says, so let me get this straight. I should go and give this to a poor person? And the Prophet ﷺ says, yes. He goes, I'm the poorest person I know. So the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, then take it home. It's for you and your family. Done. So that's an understanding. So sometimes it's just a lack of knowledge. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it's really remarkable, Surah Tawbah, Surah, um, in Surah Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Surah number 9, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the battle of Tabuk. And I kind of alluded to this earlier, it was the last major campaign in the life of the Prophet wasallam, And he personally went on this uh, journey, and it was what's referred to, in فِرُوا خِفَافًا وَثِقَالًا أَنَّ فِرُوا الْعَامِ Right? Which means, it was mandatory. Everybody had to go. Everybody who was physically capable had to go. And so everybody was pitching in and going and getting ready and whatnot. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said at that time, there were of course some munafiqoon, some hypocrites who were making just you know, silly excuses to not have to go. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemned them and spoke about them in the Qur'an. But then Allah says, لَيْسَ عَلَى الضُعَفَاء وَلَا عَلَى الْمَرْضَى وَلَا عَلَى الَّذِينَ لَا يَجِدُونَ مَا يُنْفِقُونَ حَرَجٌ That there is no blame. Not the slightest bit. Not from Allah, not from the Messenger. And there better not be any blame in the community upon people who are weak. Or people who are ill. Or people who don't have the means to undertake the journey. There should be no blame upon them. إِذَا نَصَحُوا لِلَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ As long as they continue to have a very sincere, forthcoming, forthright relationship with Allah and His Messenger wasallam. As long as they maintain that, there's no blame upon them. And I, I want to kind of... So when we talk about this, obviously, one of the conclusions I wanted to present is that what Allah has obligated upon us, we are capable of it. We just have to grow up and get serious and prioritize it. Number two, if in fact somebody has a real circumstance, a real situation, don't find yourself in a place of spiritual crisis that how could the religion be demanding this of me and dooming me to hell for all of eternity for not doing it. I don't have the ability to do it. Allah did not give me the ability. No, no, no. Learn your deen and learn your religion. Open the book of Allah. Learn the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Go talk to maybe somebody. If you don't have the full scope and the means to uh, research it, talk to people of knowledge. فَسَأَلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ That go and talk to people who do know when you don't know. And you'll be very, dare I say even shocked, rather amazed, by how compassionate and empathetic 
and holistic our deen and religion is. And how it understands people's circumstances and situations. And then there is another third point though that I would like to make. Never ever, Allah said, إِذَا نَصَحُوا لِلَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Never ever underestimate the power of sincerity. That you might not have the ability to do something that normally would be obligatory, and so you're obviously informed, you're told, it's not mandatory upon you. But that doesn't still change the fact that you can still have, you shouldn't physically or financially put yourself in harm's way, shouldn't put, risk your well-being in order to just push through and do it, if the religion hasn't put you in that situation. But having that sincerity inside you, and that dua that, oh Allah, I would love to do it. Give me the ability to do it. That's a powerful thing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here in Surah At-Tawbah, there's no blame on these people. Because they don't. They can't. They can't go. وَلَا عَلَى الَّذِينَ إِذَا مَا أَتَوْكَ لِتَحْمِلَهُمْ But Allah goes on to talk about a group of people. That there's no blame on those people that came to you. لِتَحْمِلَهُمْ That they have the physical ability to go on this journey, they just don't have the financial means. So they came to you that, oh, Prophet of Allah, provide us the financial means, like sponsor us to go on this journey. You said to them, you responded by saying, I don't have the means to take you. If I, if I did, I would. If I could, I would. But I don't have the means to take you. لا أجد ما أحملكم عليه. I don't have the means to take you. I can't sponsor you. I wish I could, but I can't. Tawallaw. They turned away. وَأَعْيُنُهُمْ تَفِيضُ مِنَ الدَّمْعِ حَزَنًا أَلَّا يَجِدُ مَا يُنْفِقُونَ They turned away from there. They turned away from the Prophet ﷺ to leave with tears flowing from their eyes, streaming down their face out of grief, like almost sorrow, that they don't have what it takes to go. I wish. Like a burning desire inside of them. And there's a story here. So when this conversation happens, they, the Prophet ﷺ tells them, sorry, I don't, I can't take you, I don't have the means. They turn from there, and they start to leave. And they go a little bit outside of the masjid. And they sit down there for a while. Just making dua. Oh Allah, please. You know, we did what we could. Please give us the ability. A little while later, and the narration mentions that there were 10 of these people. There were 10 individuals. A little while later, a man comes to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, Oh Messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I know that we're going And everyone's got to bring everything that they can bring I am ready to go I got my stuff with me I'm good to go Packed up Everything's good to go But I went home and kind of Took uh, You know I kind of assessed what I have and what I don't have And I figured out I have 10 extra animals Camels That are just standing around and I also then looked around my house and I realized I had enough supplies to be able to not just provide the camels but also load them up with the goods that are necessary for the journey. So I have prepared these camels with all the provisions necessary for the journey and I've brought all 10 of them and I'd like to donate them so that you can sponsor to go on the trip whoever you want. The Prophet ﷺ calls Bilal and he says, go get those people. And they, he, Bilal radiallahu anhu finds them not too far away from the masjid, sitting under the shade of a tree. He's kind of sitting there talking. And he goes to them and he says, Congratulations, Allah accepted your dua. Come with me. And they come to the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ, the ayah was revealed at that time. And the Prophet ﷺ recited the ayah to them and said, Allah rewarded your sincerity. So that's a third part of it. They never underestimate the power of that sincerity. And so, talking also about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, in Surah Al-Baqarah, 
um, ayah 185, says, yusra, wa la usr. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants ease for you, He does not want difficulty for you. So there is that type of practicality and accommodation within the religion. The next part of the ayah, Allah says, وَلَدَيْنَا كِتَابٌ يَنْتِقُ And we have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have a book that speaks the truth. We have a book that speaks the truth. Now, first and foremost, what's meant by this book? Kitabun, what is this book referring to? Right, what is this book? So there are two opinions of the mufassirun, of the scholars, as to what the book alludes to. Majority of the mufassirun, of the scholars of tafsir, they say this actually is speaking, this is talking about, the book here refers to the book of deeds. Right? The book of deeds. Kiraman katibina ya'lamuna ma tafa'alun. Talking about the recording of deeds. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about in Surah Al-Isra, Surah number 17, kafa that the book will be presented to the people and they'll be told, read your book, you tell me what I should do with you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, um, yalqa, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also in Surah Al-Isra, in Surah number 17, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the books being, uh, yes, وَنُخْرِجُ لَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ كِتَابًا Allah says that we will bring forth on the day of resurrection a book يَلْقَاهُ مَنْشُورًا that will be placed open and will lay everything out. In Surah Al-Kahf, in Surah number 18, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this. فَتَرَى الْمُجْرِمِينَ مُشْفِقِينَ مِمَّا فِيهِ You'll see the criminals, they'll be very afraid of what's in the book. يَقُولُونَ مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ لا يغادر صغيرة ولا كبيرة إلا حصاها. They'll say, what's wrong with this book? It doesn't leave out anything big or small, except that everything is detailed within this book. ووجدوا ما عملوا حاضرا. They'll find all their deeds presented before them. And like Allah says there, ولا يظلم ربك أحدا. Your Lord does not wrong anyone in the slightest, in the least bit. All right. So ولدينا كتاب that Allah says we have a book ينتقو بالحق that speaks the truth. They are your deeds. That will be presented before you. So that's the first interpretation of book. The second interpretation of the book that some of the scholars refer to is that they say this refers to the Qur'an. And this is referring to the fact that the Qur'an was kept in Allah al-Mahfuz. Right? وَلَدَيْنَا كِتَابٌ يَنْتِقُ بِالْحَقِّ But just from Qur'anic corroboration, it seems to allude more so to the fact that this is speaking to, speaking about uh, the book of deeds. Then it says, يَنْتِقُ بِالْحَقِّ It speaks the truth. So a little bit of a side point, even though for anyone uh, with just a basic understanding of language and expression, uh, this really is not a necessary explanation. But nevertheless, there are some questions here that sometimes some folks that have a hyper-literalist type of approach to interpretation, even though, you know, what is literal and what is not? That's another very big discussion. It's a huge philosophical discussion um, within the schools of thought and philosophy and aqidah and even interpretation of the Qur'an and the sunnah. What is literal and what is not? Well, if the Arabic language uses a word from even before, like we find the usage of a word in a particular meaning even in pre-Islamic Arabic poetry, that the Arabs used it in that type of a meaning, they used it in this manner, then doesn't that fit the very definition of being the literal interpretation of something? Because what we have to understand, and this is from, the, from, from a perspective of usul, right? the fundamentals and the principles uh, of interpretation and extrapolation, right? that the language is the language, and we do not dictate, we don't get to decide what the language is and what the language isn't. But that's one of the things that is static. The language is what it is, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke in that language for that very reason, because the language was there. And so that you would understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said through that, by means of that language. But then if we start to superimpose our own understanding or interpretation as literal and true to the text, I may think that I'm being. Now I've actually taken the Qur'an out of its literal meaning. And I've superimposed my own interpretation on it. So, yantiqu, nataqa yantiqu means to speak. So, the obvious question is that it's talking about a book speaking. 
How do you understand that? That's the personification of the book. And again, as I said, anyone who's basically familiar with language and expression, in the Arabic language itself as well, it was very common for the Arabs to refer to, especially when it comes to a book, something that has knowledge and information inside of it, that if that knowledge and that information in that book is true and sound, the, they had this expression that they would say, يَنْتِقُ بالحق, that that book speaks the truth. So that's how we can understand it. And so for it to mean that it's referring to the book of deeds, and the book of deeds will speak the truth, meaning it will only reflect your own deeds and nothing else, that that is a very valid and quite literal interpretation of it. That it will speak the truth. And then Allah says, وَهُمْ لَا يُدْلَمُونَ They will not be wronged at all, in any way, shape or form. Right? In the least bit. And as I mentioned in reference to Surah Al-Kahf, Allah says, وَلَا يَظْلِمُوا رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا That they will not be wronged in the least bit. That also reaffirms the fact that this is talking about the Book of Deeds, because that's exactly the same type of, um, that's the same message Allah gives when He talks about the Book of Deeds, that you won't be wronged. It is your own deeds that you'll be looking at, at that time. Ayah number 63, Allah says, بَلْ قُلُوبُهُمْ فِي غَمْرَةٍ مِّنْ هَذَا وَلَهُمْ أَعْمَالٌ مِّن دُونِ ذَلِكَ هُمْ لَهَا عَمِلٌ a very brief translation of that is that, but the disbelievers' hearts are steeped in ignorance of all this, and there are other things besides this that they do. So, Allah says, Bal, rather. So now that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that this is within your capacity, this is within your capacity, that how are people still? Doubtful of all of this. Now, like I talked, I said before, I kind of alluded to this, that that's a problem. If I'm still doubtful in all this, then that's a problem within me. And that's exactly what Allah says. But rather, بَلْ قُلُوبُهُمْ فِي غَمْرَةٍ مِنْ هَذَا Their hearts are drowning in neglect and delusion in regards to this issue. That they're just in denial. They're completely drowning in their own denial. وَلَهُمْ أَعْمَالٌ مِنْ دُونِ ذَلِكَ And they have deeds other than this, هُمْ لَهَا عَامِلُونَ That they do very willingly. And what that basically means, again, it's kind of uh, an expression in the Arabic language, meaning that there are so many other things that they're committed to, so many other things that they're able to achieve and accomplish, that oftentimes require quite a bit of effort and application and allocation of resources. And they're able to do those things. Why? Because they commit themselves to them. They see value in it. They prioritize those things. Right? Maybe somebody's got, you know, really is applied within their career. Or, you know, their education. Or whatever, you know, their social status. Or whatever it may be. Right? Hobbies. Right? That, that they're so committed to. And they're quite... Remarkable that. They've really achieved a lot in that particular area. How were they able to do that? They have other things that they're completely committed to. Why? Because again, we go back to the steps. They prioritized it. And they focused and allocated resources to it. And they were committed to it. And they saw value in it. Right? And they were able to achieve great things. Relatively speaking, great things. Right? They were able to achieve certain milestones, but in useless pursuits and endeavors. And that's why what's very interesting, Allah doesn't say, وَلَهُمْ أَعْمَالٌ غَيْرَ ذَلِكَ He says, مِن دُونِ ذَلِكَ And the word مِن دُونِ comes from the meaning of being less. That there are lesser things that they are involved with, هُمْ لَهَا عَامِلُونَ And they achieve remarkable things there in lesser you know, pursuits. And that just shows that because... Those things are important to them. And these things are not. In the next ayah, ayah number 64, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, حَتَّى إِذَا أَخَذْنَا مُتْرَفِيهِمْ بِالْعَذَابِ إِذَا هُمْ يَجْعَرُونَ 
A very brief translation. When we bring our punishment on those corrupted with wealth, they will, they will cry for help. So here we see the reoccurrence of a few words that we've, a couple of words that we've talked about before. Hatta, Allah says, until, إِذَا أَخَدْنَا Then, rather, hatta here usually it translates as until, because it's continuing on a previous thought. But there's a lot of discussion here, I won't get into a lot of the details of it amongst the Mufassirun, and the scholars of the Qur'an, and those who linguistically uh, analyze the Qur'an. This hatta is, is more what they call ibtida'iyah. Like it's in the meaning of then. Then, Allah says, إِذَا أَخَدْنَا When we snatch them, when we grab them. Grab who? Mutrafihim. When we grab mutrafihim. And remember we talked about taraf, right? وَكَذَّبُوا بِلِقَاءِ الْآخِرِ وَأَتْرَفْنَاهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا We talked about the overindulgence within material things. So mutrafi, like mutrafina, right? Mutrafi, it's the light version. Right? Mutrafina, it means those who overindulge in material things. And so mutrafi him, those amongst them who are overindulging within material things. So Allah says, then when we snatch, when we grab, when we hold accountable, the overindulgent amongst them in material things, and how are we gonna grab them and snatch them? Bil adab, with the punishment. Idahum yaja'arun. Idahum yaja'arun. Then all of a sudden, they will scream. So, I wanted to linguistically first explain this word, yaja'arun, because this is kind of a new word that we've seen now. This comes from the root of jim, uh, hamza and ra, and some also say jim, wow and ra. And what the word jim, hamza and ra, ja'ara, what it refers to is, the lexicon explains it as, رَفْعُ صَوْتِهِ مَعَا تَضَرُّعٍ وَإِسْتِغَاثَةٍ It means to cry out. To cry out. And similarly, um, some of the scholars also explain that, um, so for instance, Qatada, one of the Mufassirun, he says, إِذَاهُمْ يَجْعَرُونَ إِذَاهُمْ يَجْزَعُونَ When they'll freak out. He describes it as almost as like freaking out. Because crying out can also be done very, it's got also, can have a very beautiful presentation to it as well. When Zakariyah cries out, calls out to his master, that's very beautiful. When the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is making dua, right? يَسْتَغِيثُ بِرَبِّهِ He's begging for Allah's help and assistance on the night before Badr. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. But this is not a beautiful, this is freaking out. إِذَاكُمْ يَتْزَعُونَ uh, a suddi says, Yasihun, they just scream like wild animals. Qala Mujahid, Mujahid, another one of the Mufassirun of the Quran, a student of the Sahaba, he says, Yadarrauna, Yadarrauna dua'an. That at that time they'll cry out to Allah to help them. And this will make sense in just a minute. Um, and Johari, he actually uh, points out something, Imam al Johari, he points out something very interesting, remarkable. He says, Al Juar, Al Juar. مثل الخوار جوار خوار Do you see how the words kind of rhyme with each other? It's just a jim versus a kha. And we know that the difference between a jim and a kha is what? Just the placement of the dot, even the shape of the letter is the same. Juar khuwar. He said these two words are related. What does khuwar refer to? It's used in the Quran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about uh, the calf that Banu Israel ended up, or some of them ended up worshipping, while Musa alayhi salam was gone, how in Surah Taha, in Surah number 20, how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe that, that calf made out of gold and silver, that they had constructed and they were worshipping, ijalan, jasadan, that it was the physical form of a calf, lahu khuwarun. So an animal, like an ox or a bull or a cow, kind of the guttural sound that it has, is described in the Arabic language as khuwar. So it's the sound of an animal. And juwar is very similar to that. Juwar then, he makes his contrast because he's saying that it is the sound that a human being makes, that, that's when that human being is screaming or braying like an animal. That that's what's called juwar. And so this is, and also Al-Akhfash, another one, the scholars of the Arabic language, he also talks about one of the derivatives of this. He says, غَيْثٌ جُوَأَرٌ That rain 
when it's so heavy that it makes a lot of noise, even just the rain falling makes noise, right? That's called ghaythun juarun, rain that makes a lot of noise. All right, so it's a lot of noise, like it's a loud, very obnoxious sound. When they will scream out, when they will cry out. But even that translation doesn't do it justice because Allah is saying that it will be the most disgusting and obnoxious sound any human being could ever make. That's a very, very serious reprimand. So exactly who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about and what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying here? So Allah is saying that Hatta ida akhadna, when they are uh, when they are hit, Allah says, then when we hit them with the punishment, those people that were so overindulgent into the material things, they be, they became completely, absolutely spiritually um, disconnected, and they became they reached to the point of neglect and apathy. They just didn't care. They were drowning in their own desires, and then we hit them with the punishment then that's when they will cry out and scream like wild animals. Right? They'll scream like, like crazy animals. So now what is this exactly talking about? There are two opinions of the Mufassirun, two very dominant and popular interpretations of the Mufassirun in regards to this. The first of them, Imam Al-Qurtubi rahimullah ta'ala actually attributes this to Abdullah bin Abbas, Radiallahu uh, ta'ala excuse me, rather I should say that there are three interpretations of this. Excuse me. There are three meanings. And it's possible and it's very likely that all three are being implied here. We can understand all three of them. The first of them, Imam al Qurtubi attributes this to Abdullah bin Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. It's also narrated by Abd Haq, one of the tabi'un, the mufassirun of the Quran. He says this is referring to the drought and the famine that had struck Mecca. And what happened was, towards the latter part of the Meccan period, when the persecution and the torture of the people of Mecca reached just unfathomable levels, like it really got to the point of being unbearable, the Prophet of Allah wasallam made dua. And he said, Allahumma shdud wat'aka ala mudar. Oh Allah, Severely and harshly come down on Mudar. Mudar is one of the names of the tribes of Quraysh. They're also known as the people of Mudar. That's one of the names of their forefathers. So they're known by that name. So he said, Oh Allah, come down harsh on the, on the people of Mudar. Allahumma ja'alha alayhim sinina kasini Yusuf. Oh Allah, put a drought or famine on them, like the drought and the famine that's talked about in Surah Yusuf. You know when they when the 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 dream of the king is brought to Yusuf alayhi salam and he interprets it and he gives the whole the strategy and the plan and then he manages the people throughout that drought those 7 years a very severe drought that put drought and famine on them like the one that is talked about at the time of Yusuf alayhi salam فَابْتَلَاهُمُ اللَّهُ بِالْقَحْطِ and such a famine came upon the people of Makkah wal Ju' and such hunger afflicted them, hatta akalu al-idama wal maytata wal kilaba wal jif, that they reached the point where they were eating bones. They were chewing on the bones of animals. Wal mayta, they were willing to eat, you know, even animals die in a famine, right, in a drought, that they would find a dead animal on the side of the road and they were willing to eat dead animals that they found. Wal kilab, dogs. They would just grab dogs and eat dogs. Waljif, anything that they could lay their hands on. Wahalaka al amwala wal awlad. And they lost their wealth, they lost, people lost family. Idahum yaja arun, that a yadidjun, yadudjun, that they finally cried and they begged that this be removed from this, this be alleviated from them. And the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua and it was lifted away from them. So that's the first place, first place where we can see or first interpretation of the ayah that it's making reference to that. The second interpretation of it is that this is, and again, this is a very popular opinion amongst the Mufassirun, that this is referring to the Battle of Badr. This is referring to the Battle of Badr. 
And Ibn Juraj, one of the classical mufassirun, he explains this very well. Hatta ila akhadna mutrafihim bil adab that when we hit them with the punishment, we hit the overindulgence amongst them with the punishment. Humul ladina qutilu bi Badr. That's referring to the leaders of Quraysh that were killed in the battle of Badr. Idahum yaj arun. And then all of a sudden, they're now screaming and crying like wild animals. Humul ladina bi Makkah. That's describing the people back in Makkah when they heard the news about what happened in Badr. So it's describing the battle of Badr. That the punishment of Allah eventually came. And that's why you look at the list of the leaders of Quraysh that fell in Badr. Abu Jahl, Utbah, Rabi'ah, Shayba, And the list goes on and on. That these terrible people, overindulgent within their material things, who were at the head of the opposition against the Prophet ﷺ. And they were at the front of the persecution of the Muslims. That that caught up to them. And they were hit with that punishment in the battle of Badr. They were struck down by angels in the battlefield. And then when the news reached back in Mecca, then they screamed and cried and yelled and moaned and groaned. But it was to no avail. It did them no good. So this, the second interpretation is that it's talking about the battle of Badr. The third one, and that's why I feel like all three can be understood from this ayah, the third one is that this is talking about the Day of Judgment. That they lived their lives however they wanted to, but on the Day of Judgment when they face the punishment, that's when they'll yell and they'll scream and they'll cry. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this within the Qur'an a number of places. In Surah Fatir, in Surah number 35, Ayahs 36 and 37, Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَهُمْ نَارُ جَهَنَّمُ That those who disbelieve, reserved for them is the fire of hell. لا يقضى عليهم. They will not be allowed to. They will. They will not be allowed to just leave the punishment. فيموتوا and just die. ولا يخفف عنهم من عذابها. And the punishment will not be lightened. Like their punishment will not be alleviated. كذلك نجزي كل Allah says that is that is how we reward. Like that is how we pay back those who display true ingratitude. وَهُمْ يَسْتَرِخُونَ فِيهَا And they'll yell and they'll scream in the fire of hell. رَبَّنَا أَخْرِجْنَا نَعْمَلْ صَالِحًا غَيْرَ الَّذِي كُنَّا نَعْمَلْ Oh Allah, just take us out. You'll see, we'll do good things. We won't act the way that we acted previously. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another place in the Qur'an, He describes the same thing in Surah Al-Zukhruf, وَنَادَوْ They'll scream, they'll cry out, يَا مَالِكْ Malik is the gatekeeper of Khazinu Jahannam. He's the warden of hell. وَنَادُوا يَا مَالِكُ لِيَقْضِي عَلَيْنَا رَبُّكُ They'll say that, tell Allah to just change the decision in regards to us. قَالَ إِنَّكُمْ مَاكِثُونَ He'll say, you're staying right where you are. They'll cry and they'll beg and they'll scream and they'll be told that اِخْسَأُوا فِيهَا وَلَا تُكَلِّمُونَ Be quiet. Be quiet in the fire. And never address me. Don't speak to me. So they'll make all types of pleas. But unfortunately, as we say, too little, too late. Right? Then they'll scream and they'll cry and they'll say, We believe and we understand. But it's past that point. And you know, even though I number 65 continues this on. But very quickly, as a brief pause here, whenever we talk about these types of ayat, and you know, it's, it's very heavy, and it shakes you up. And for a moment, the thought kind of occurs that, or maybe somebody else brings a question, that this seems really harsh. It seems really, really harsh. But what we really need to focus on is instead of rather than projecting, reflect don't project, but reflect. We've been told to reflect upon the Qur'an. Ponder the Qur'an. Reflect, don't project. And what do you end up realizing when you reflect? Are we sitting here, reading it, understanding it? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are realizing, maybe we don't realize this completely, but Allah is telling us exactly what not to do, and what happens if you do what you're told not to do. 
And Allah keeps encouraging, you can do the right thing. And if you find yourself in a situation where you really have trouble doing the right thing, don't worry, we'll still accommodate you and forgive you. But if you just don't care, and you don't even have concern about doing the right thing, then this is how things end up. We're sitting here right now reading all of this. How much more merciful can Allah be? How much easier can Allah make it for us? That everything's laid out for us right here. There is no mystery here, folks. There's no mystery. We've been told exactly what to do and what not to do. And what happens if we do what we're supposed to do, or at least try to do what we're supposed to do? And what happens if we don't care at all about doing what we're supposed to do? That's it. And then for us to actually try to entertain the idea or the thought, like, that's really harsh, that's not fair, that's not right, that's not... What? What are we talking about? It's, it's like served up on a silver platter. It's right there. We just have to... Quite literally, Allah is just telling us to make the intention to do the right thing and take a small, itty little, little step in the right direction. That's it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes us the rest of the way. He takes us as far as we can go and He forgives us for the rest and He still gives us the full reward. In ayah number 65, Allah says, لا تجأروا اليوم لا تجأروا اليوم لا تجأروا اليوم إنكم منا لا تنصرون A brief translation, do not cry, do not groan this day in the life of the hereafter, according to the translator, but don't cry today, إِنَّكُمْ مِنَّا لَا تُنْصَرُونَ That for never will you be helped by us. You are not going to receive any help from us. And again, we have to connect it back to all three scenarios, that whether it's the results of our own misdeeds that we're facing in this world, then crying, see again, if it's being said that you're not going to be helped, then what? where's repentance? And this actually does strengthen the position of those scholars who say this is referring to the day of resurrection, the day of judgment. Because in this world you can always change your course. But to those mufassirun who do say that it's referring to a particular punishment in the life of this world, that what they're more so saying is that just the groaning and the crying, like kind of the self-pity. Oh me, why is this happening? Woe be to me, right? Why is this happening to me? Why, why would this happen to me? Why do I have to, do, right? That's not going to help you. And that's not going to bring any help or assistance from Allah. Brother, what you need to do is you need to change your course of action. You need to change your direction. But again, what seems to make a little bit more sense now when you piece the ayat together that this is talking about the day of resurrection, the life of the hereafter, then of course they're being told, لا تجعلوا اليوم اخسأوا فيها Just be quiet. Your crying and your moaning and your groaning is not going to help you today. إِنَّكُمْ مِنَّا لَا تُنْصَرُونَ That as far, you're not going to be helped in the least bits from us. And what's very interesting, there's, a, there's balagha here in the ayah that some of the mufassirun and the scholars, they point out that is really um, remarkable. That instead of saying, لَا نَنْصُرُكُمْ We are not going to help you. It says, إِنَّكُمْ Most definitely you, minna, from us, la tunsarun, you will not be helped. It almost sounds like a roundabout way of saying, we won't, we're not going to help you. But it's saying, from us, you will not be helped at all by us. Why not just say, we're not going to help you? Because when you say we're, we've studied the passive, right? The passive fi'al, the passive verb. When you say, we're not going to help you, where's the focus of the sentence? We. Like, we're not helping you. Because we don't want to help you. Because maybe we don't think you deserve the help. Or we just don't want to help you. But in reality, who's the culprit here? Why are they not getting help? Whose fault is it? Is it Allah's fault? Or is it their fault? Of course it's their fault. So that's why Allah says it in what seems like a roundabout way, but it's powerful and it's beautiful and it's eloquent. Allah is saying, إِنَّكُمْ مِنَّا لَا تُنْصَرُونَ You will not be helped. Because this is the result of your choice. These, this is the outcome of your decisions. These are the outcomes of your decisions and your choices. And so you will not be helped from us, by us. Because Allah is the only one who can help on that day. 
Right? Allah is the only one who can help on that day. And that uh, particular point that I mentioned, that even if we are interpreting it as in the life of this world, that you will not be helped by us, you will not be helped from us, that it means that just crying and basically crying, you know, self-pity, and just crying and complaining, complaining and whining, isn't going to help you at all. Al-Hasan al-Basri rahimullah ta'ala says, لَا تُنصَرُونَ بِقُبُولِ تَوْبَةِ That you still don't get the point. You should change your ways. Tawbah. Repent. Don't whine and cry, but repent. Feel remorseful and regretful and repent. Right? But don't whine and cry. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this in Surah Tur, Ayah 16, إِسْبِرُوا أَوْ لَا تَصْبِرُوا سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْكُمْ That on the day of judgment, they'll be told, be patient or don't be patient. Now it's all the same. In the life of the world, it made a difference. Whether you were patient or not patient. But over there, you chose a lack of patience. But now, سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْكُمْ It's all the same. It doesn't make any difference. Ayah number 16 Excuse me. Ayah number 66. I was like, I know we're further along than that. Okay, ayah number 66. Allah says, قَدْ كَانَتْ آيَاتِي تُتْلَى عَلَيْكُمْ فَكُنْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ تَنْكِسُونَ A very brief translation. Time and time again, my messages were recited to you. My signs were recited upon you. But you turned arrogantly on your heels. So there's... A couple of very, uh, or rather, two words that I'd like to just kind of delve into and then we'll go through the ayah. The first word is aqabikum. Aqab is the plural of the word aqab. Aqab, which refers to the heels, the heel of the foot. Alright? And it basically, to turn back on your heels, is even we understand it as an expression. In Arabic it's an expression um, of going backwards. Going backwards, right? Going in the wrong direction. Going in the wrong direction. That's what it represents. Tan kisun do. Tan kisun nakasa is a very interesting word. And it specifically means, Raja amma kana alayhi min khair. La yuqalu dalika illa fi ruju'i anil khair. The scholars of the language say, nakasa in the Arabic language is a very, very negative word. It specifically refers to turning away from that which is good for you. Turning away from something that's good. And ala aqabikum tankis ala aqabikum tankisun. That means that going in the wrong direction for the wrong reasons. Okay? So now to understand the ayah, that at that point in time, again, kind of solidifying the argument, what I basically just mentioned, somebody reading this, again. Saying, well, that sounds really harsh. That doesn't sound fair. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it. Allah answers that objection before somebody can make that objection in ayah number 16. ayati. Allah speaks in the first person here. Ayati, my signs. That my signs, without a doubt, qad, kanat. Kanat here, kana. Remember we studied it, it shows that continuity. Without a doubt, consistently, my signs were recited upon you. Meaning that you were surrounded by reminders of my greatness and the truth. And the Qur'an was recited upon you constantly, without a doubt, undoubtedly. فَكُنْتُمْ But you also consistently. See again, the kana, kuntum. Kana is used here again. But you consistently, عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ تَنْكِسُونَ You kept, and again, tankisun is said in the mudari'ah which is the present slash future tense form, which shows re- repetition, which implies repetition. The past tense implies co- uh, confirmation. And the present tense uh, implies repetition. But you repeatedly kept taking, going in the wrong direction for the wrong reasons. Even though it wasn't good for you, forget about the life of the hereafter, it wasn't even good for you in the life of the world. But you just kept going in the wrong direction for the wrong reasons. So my signs, Allah says, were repeatedly recited upon you, were staring you in the face, were poured down upon you. Somewhat so that Allah says, You yourself are a sign 
of the greatness and the oneness of Allah. But then you repeatedly and continuously kept going in the wrong direction for the wrong reasons. It's a very, very um, powerful uh, thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here. In Surah Ghafir, ayahs 11 and 12, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala similarly says, Qalu, they will say in the fire of hell, Rabbana, our Lord, our Master, Amatta You gave us death twice. Meaning, we did not exist, you brought us to life, and then we ended in the life of the world. Right? So we had two stages of lifelessness. And you gave us life twice. Life in the world and now life in the hereafter. فَاعْتَرَفْنَا بِذُنُوبِنَا We now confess to our sins. We now confess to our sins. فَهَلْ إِلَىٰ خُرُوجٌ مِنْ سَبِيلٍ Is there any way out of this? Can we work something out now? Is there anything that we can figure out? Is there anything we can work out? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ذَلِكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers them by providing an explanation. ذَلِكُمْ بِأَنَّهُ إِذَا دُعِيَ اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ كَفَرْتُمْ Every single time, every single time, and actually Allah uses إِذَا which implies that even if you were given another chance, Every single time you were called to Allah, to Him alone, kafartum. You rejected, you disbelieved, you were ungrateful. And if you were given another chance, you would do the same thing again. But the second that the opportunity presented itself to associate a partner with Allah, right? And we talked about the full scope and meaning of that, where you even prioritize things over Allah. Then you were very compliant. When you were told to prioritize Allah, then, you know, I got a lot of things I got to take care of. I got places to go, people to see, things to do. But every single time you were called to other than Allah, you were asked to prioritize things other than Allah, then you were like, absolutely, makes total sense. I'm on board. فَالْحُكْمُ لِلَّهِ الْعَلِيِّ الْكَبِيرِ So the decision now belongs to Allah, who is... The, the highest, the most elevated. Al-Kabir and the greatest. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers that question or objection that could occur in anyone's mind. We'll go ahead and stop here for today inshallah. The next ayah involves uh, some very interesting explanation um, and some very powerful lessons inshallah going forward. It's also a new passage from ayah number 67. Um, so we'll start that inshallah in the next session. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that's been said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.